Hello, everyone. Uh, it's probably a good afternoon. Uh, so first of all, a, a big thanks to all of you for coming down over here, beating the heat outside. So we should definitely have a round of applause for you guys first. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. So before we start, uh, a brief introduction about me. Uh, I am a graduate of KIT University. And uh, it has been since the last four years, I am uh, breaking and making sessions with Book My Show. And uh, if when I'm not coding, you might find me uh, playing tabla or uh, some painting at any of the cafe shops. Okay, that's, that's all about me. Yeah. Uh, so today we'll uh, mostly uh, see about uh, all other, we'll discuss about uh, Golang and how we can uh, design uh, producers and consumers in Golangs. Uh, so to keep the session more interactive, uh, so I have just broken down the session into our three sections. So it's easier for everyone to understand and we can have a two way, uh, two way communication in between. So we have multiple places where uh, we can discuss, we can discuss use cases if we have any and uh, we'll, we'll keep the entire conversation two way. Okay. And at any point of time, if anyone is having any doubt, just uh, raise your hand so that it grabs my attention and we can uh, quickly take that question and then carry forward. Good. So any question coming to anyone's mind, right? Uh, uh, by like, but just, just by the name of this topic, any question coming to like, what, any, any questions, like just, just reading the topic, any question, just coming to your mind, any random question. The first thing that comes to our mind when uh, we are uh, talking about concurrency, uh, the first thing is concurrency versus parallelism, right? What is concurrency and what is parallelism? When, in, in many of our uh, daily use cases, we might be using these two terms very frequently, but at the same time, we might not know the full difference or the full clarity at this point of time. Uh, so if you, uh, if you see this, this is basically the, uh, a, a bookish definition. So two or more processes are said to be concurrent if they are executing seemingly at the same time. So mind the words in, uh, this, uh, highlighted in red, uh, two or more process are said to be in parallel if they are running exactly at the same time. So what makes the difference is basically this. This, the part highlighted in red. We'll take a quick example. So to understand this, this bit. So let's take, we'll, we'll just uh, think it of as a story and uh, through the story only we'll understand the concepts. So consider I am a, uh, like I have just switched from developer and I am just uh, opening up my new restaurant, correct? At uh, the starting point, I don't have much budget. So I have set up all the tables and everything is set up but I have kept only one waiter. Okay. Uh, now the problem, this, this, this poor guy is literally confused now. What to do? This uh, is such a big restaurant having four, four tables and customers are coming in. So what this guy has to do is, uh, he will uh, go to one table, pick up the order, uh, maybe uh, just pick up the order for the starters first. Uh, he will go to the chef, place the order. And then again, uh, by the time you, the first table decides what, he has to order for his main course. Uh, he can go and uh, take the order for the next table, like take the starter order for the next table. Now this guy is like, literally confused. Like he's going to, running from one table to another and uh, taking one by one orders. And like, uh, like it's, 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 it's a bit on his part. Correct. So let's replace this waiter with a, uh, with a single core system. So the waiter is just replaced by a single core system. Now what happens over here is uh, this go scheduler is using only one core and it's taking one go routine at a time. It's going to the uh, single core. It's executing that routine. It's again coming back and taking the next. This is, this is a simple, this is just an analogy how the waiter is also performing in our case. All right. Now I have gathered some more money. My restaurant is going good. 
so i have deployed two waiters now the scenario becomes very simple okay now actually these two waiters can take order from two tables simultaneously so he doesn't have to wait correct so now what 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 have I, what i have achieved over here is i have achieved parallelism okay so the same thing we will just replace this single core machine with multiple cores with multiple cores we'll just replace the single core with multiple cores now what happens at this point of time this go scheduler can actually execute multiple routines at the same time so we have achieved parallelism and now we can exactly execute multiple threads and multiple processes exactly at the same time let's consider a bit of a case so uh, you guys must be aware about web scraping if you don't ever right web scraping what it is yeah so uh, i just need to share the screen Mm, so I will just uh, try to stimulate a kind of web scrapping scenario so that it's uh, we, uh, it's it's easier for everyone to understand. So if you see in this code, uh, what I am doing is I have some uh, list of famous sites. Okay, uh, these are some famous uh, listing sites. Uh, what this code is doing is uh, basically uh, I this is the check link function, and what it will do is. Uh, so what this will do is it will just uh, go and uh, just hit that URL, okay? To sim to stimulate that uh, web scrapping scenario, what I have done is uh, we have just added a ten milliseconds delay, just to stimulate a bit of processing. Right? So we'll just uh, and uh, one more thing what we have done over here is we are just calculating the time, like uh, at t one second it's starting. We are starting with the execution, and uh, then we are taking the difference. We will just take the difference uh, of the time that is take to execute the code. We'll quickly uh, just execute it. Uh, yeah. So we'll just do a simple go run. Main dot go. Yeah. So we started executing. It is hitting basically the URLs one by one. And uh, at last, we will just see the time taken to execute is seven point four three seconds. Okay, cool. Let's modify this use case with our go routine now. Okay, so we'll, what we will do is we will just split this task, the same task. We will just split it into go routines, and we will just give respective threads to execute the. Uh, is function. Yeah. Uh, just we'll just. Uh, everything remains same. We just need to uh, like we'll just. Uh, if everything remains same in this uh, in this example. Uh, just the only thing that uh, that we are doing over here is, uh, if you see, we are just yeah we are just instead of simply calling the function, what we are doing is we are just taking the uh, we are just using this go go keyword to fire a thread. That that's the only thing that we are doing. Oh shit! Like, what does happen, right? We did nothing. We just uh, added a, a thread, and but unfortunately, our uh, code didn't execute only. If you see, so it's just uh, the time taken is in some nanoseconds, and the code didn't execute actually. So let's understand what's the problem is. Okay, it's a full, it's a garbage scenario now. Okay, so let's understand what the problem is. The problem is we have fired the go routines, right? Using this keyword, we have fired the go routines, but my main thread is actually not waiting for the child thread to complete its execution, correct? So to have a better control on this one, Go has something 
called as go routine okay so the task of this go routine is it basically waits for your go routine to finish its execution cool uh like like if if you have seen this uh, like uh, this season when i then would have might but have led to it like the way just uh, this guy was waiting for his washroom to be fixed so let's uh, now run run the same uh, code snippet but we will be using wet groups <clears throat> uh let's see the everything remains the same uh the only thing that we will be doing over here is uh yeah so what we are doing what uh, apart the everything like what previously we saw everything remains the same the only difference is we are creating a weight group now and this uh weight group is whenever we are iterating or whenever we are spinning up a new thread we are just adding a uh, we are just adding one to it for the weight group to spawn and at the next we are just waiting for the weight group to complete so this weight group will wait till uh, the my all my threads has finished execution okay so now we'll just quickly run this one the results are in front of you you can see the time taken from 7 seconds i am down to 1.69 seconds correct just a, just a minor tweak in my code i am just achieving this kind of a performance improvement cool let's move now the question is what did i just use here was it parallelism or was it concurrency i we saw that we gen, we definitely had a good improvement for our uh, performance but what is what exactly we used here is it a concurrent code or it's a parallel code to to understand the difference uh, we need uh, go has something called as go max props yeah. so what is the purpose of this go max props go max props basically helps you define whether you are use whether you are we should use one core or multiple core of your system so it basically gives me a control whether i can use a single core or i want to use multi core for my system, for my uh, for my uh, for my use case all right uh, if we just go to this uh, code snippet also if you see to define a go max props we will just uh, use this this is the runtime package we will just uh, add the go max prop value here for this use case i am using uh, runtime dot cpu this basically means that we are using all the cores that is present in our system uh, at any point of time if you want to reduce it down if you want to use one core if you want to use two core so you just uh, modulate the value accordingly cool what benefit does this go max prop gives me it gives me a better performance tuning so i am now with this go max props i am i am able to control the number of threads i am able to control the number of cpu my uh, program would use my uh, so this gives me a, like i am not just unnecessarily wasting my resources i am modulating it i am calculating it and i am then i am implementing it then gives a better resource management so it it is preventing me like suppose i have some simple task right and i am using all my cores that is not actually required i can it's if it's a light task i can definitely use only single core that it gives me a better resource management next it is giving me an optimal balance between my concurrency and parallelism what should i use so uh as in the first diagram if you have seen if we are using multiple cores we are basically achieving parallelism and if we are using a single core we are achieving only concurrency now any questions like any questions coming to your mind like uh, using this group prop the next question that uh, obvious for us to ask is what how can i determine this value like what value should i use in my code 
so everything is in balance the first factor and the important factor is the number of cpu cores in my machine how many cpus i have in my machine that is a very important factor because I, like if i don't have the available resource i cannot definitely cannot use it correct then the nature of my task what task or what action my thread is performing based on that i have to modulate this value so that uh, my resource is not like i am not i'm just not over utilizing my resources right uh, the third and the one of the most important point that comes is concurrency limitations so suppose i am uh, building a system and i am calling some external system or internal system it can be internal external any system okay i i am a, i am i am having a huge pool of resource so i am using all my 8 core 16 core machines and i am firing threads i am firing maybe 100 200 threads right but the external system is not that scalable to handle that kind of load so what i am doing is basically i am wasting my resources right so we need to keep this thing in mind like whenever we are using some when we are calling some external 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 apps or external apis we need to also take into consideration what is the uh, load taking capacity of that system accordingly we can modulate our own system to uh, find that sweet number next uh, we have still covered in the previous slide that is resource utilization how much resource i want to use and also if we have profiling in our code based on those numbers based on the uh, based on this analysis i can come to that number like what would be the good number for my max purpose cool now let's go back again to the uh, my uh, restaurant example now i have like i have scaled my i i am i'm a rich guy now right i have i have scaled my uh, restaurant to next level right now what i have done is i have employed n number of waiters okay so now consider this waiters don't have a like they don't gel up with each other so they don't talk to each other the waiters are doing their job very well but they are segregated from each other they don't talk they don't talk much so this one table uh this single table this guy is also coming to take the order uh, this uh, the customer has already placed the order the second guy is again coming to take the order and the third guy is again coming to take so like this guy is now irritated like are you what is what is happening here i just placed my order and again and again you guys are coming it out right so that is basically hampering my customer performance a cust customer satisfaction so how can we improve that the only way to improve is to increase the communication between these waiters so for this go has something called as go channels so what what these channels do basically they are a communication medium between your threads when when i have spun n number of child routines i in this case i have spun three child routines and the the main routine and they are basically this channel acts as a medium to communicate between this uh between these routines cool so now my uh, problem is solved if these guys are communicating with each other and now i am having a good good running restaurant right cool yeah so now we'll see how can we uh, create channels basically so to create channels uh, we'll just use this uh, chan keyword uh, like this is this is basically making creating a channel and just like our previous example uh, we are just firing the threads and this this for loop is just uh, listening from this channels and printing the uh, results that is coming into the channel so all my threads what they are doing is they are basically uh, pinging they are just doing a get to that link and uh, based on the results if it's a error it will uh, push a message that site is down if it's up it will give a link is up okay and uh, this loop is basically reading the message from my channel now we have increased the uh, communication between the channels 
Go gives us the option to two kinds of channels. One is a buffer channels. So what this buffer channel do? We call it as an asynchronous mode of communication. So these channels have a special buffered size. They can hold the data, right? So what? Why we call it as asynchronous? Because in this you in this buffer channels, the producer who is producing the message to the channel and the consumer which is consuming the messages from your channel can walk at its own pace. So for example, this. Uh, like the producer, uh, like maybe pushing the messages in burst, maybe 10 packets at a time, 20 packets at a time. And my consumer can uh, like consume the message at his own pace. For this kind of use case, we uh, are using the buffer channels. Uh, first of all, like uh, maybe you find too many of this uh, panchayat memes. It does not a promotion or anything or sign of that sort. I just, uh, while just coming down to Mumbai, I saw a big banner. So I just thought of maybe that would be a good point of reference to connect with you guys. So there is this, this is not a promotion or anything. Cool. Then we have something called as unbuffered channels. Okay. So these are basically synchronous mode of communication. In this case, the as and when the consumer produces the, uh, the producer produces the message, the consumer has to consume it and there is no room for delay. Cool. Any question, uh, like any question that is coming to your mind that we have this uh, go routines and channels and anything. Any obvious question, like so the obvious questions that might come is why do we need go routines? We have OS threads, so why? What is the need of these go routines? The first thing. To understand why we need go routine, we should understand system calls. So I think many of you must be aware about system calls. So system calls basically they are the interface or they are the point of contact for for your application or for a compiler to interact with the system kernel. Right? Uh, like for example, you are opening a file or you want to you want to call an API, you want to do an I/O operations. So this kernel calls are basically interface between you and your kernel. But the one thing that we need to keep in mind is this, this uh, kernel calls are very much resource in intensive. So our only aim would be to optimize this system calls like system calls obviously would be there when you are, uh, when you are uh, opening a file, you are doing an IO system calls are definitely necessary, but like, uh, like how we can, we can optimize it. That is, that is, that would be the purpose. Cool. Now let's again come to the same same uh, better example. I have scaled up my I have scaled up my restaurant. I have n I have a good amount of budget now. So what I have done is I have n number of uh, I have employed n number of waiters with n number of chefs. So one waiter is assigned to one chef, right? But what is the problem here? Anyone? What's the problem here? Correct. That's it. So the chefs in my case, all, not only the chefs, the waiter is also underutilized, right? Because, uh, they are, although it's a one on one mapping, but I cannot expect a full house in my restaurant every time. Right? So I am basically wasting my resources. I am uh, one waiter. Like it's like sitting idle. Maybe, maybe he's having only one order for a day and less of them sitting idle. Right? So how to optimize this one? <laughs> Definitely the best thing that comes to our mind is we will implement an order queue. What it will do is the waiters will come, put the order in that queue and the chef can take the order, prepare the order and pass it to the waiter and the waiter can deliver it to the customer. This is a very simple. I am just uh, assigning N waiters to M chefs. Cool. What is the pro what was the problem with that uh, previous uh, system? What is the problem with the previous design? Good. 
So the problem with my previous design was, I am having a single order queue. You know, I am having only one order queue. Now imagine my all my waiters are coming and putting down order in that same queue and all the chefs also using that same queue to take the order. So my order queue is now cluttered. Correct. Now to manage that better, what will I do? I will just add a mutex. So what I will do, like whenever a guy is a waiter is coming to place its order, I will just add a lock so that he can place his order and I will then release the lock so the other waiters can place its order. Similarly, when the chef is taking that order, we'll just again, like we'll add a read lock again. We'll just lock the chef can read it and then we'll unlock. So now what I am wasting over here is most of my time I am wasting to lock and unlock this queue. I have implemented a very uh, good synchronized system, but now most of my time I am wasting is to just create the locks and unlock the, unlock the queue. Now, what can I do now? So I can create local instances of the queue so that I don't, I, I here also, I will have to apply lock to the main queue, but my number of locks would be reduced to a great extent. So I am just creating local queues and this local queues will have the data that only needs that is needed by the thread to process the process the process for the purpose of the thread to process it has the data and along with its own set of memory so this 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 unit this area marked in blue has all the required details with its own its own local queue its own like memory its own values own own, own variables with him so that it can it can execute con it's own. It doesn't have to depend on the global queue. And once the execution is done at that point of time, it will take a lock. It will just uh, push the message to the result to the global queue and it will so that and, and it will get itself free. That's what is done by our Go scheduler. This is how Go scheduler is basically managing between the threads and uh, managing between your routines and uh, making making this go routines a lighter one. The final thing, what what uh, differences we have between these OS threads and go routines? The first thing I have a stack management. Just an example. This has its own small stack, and it's not using the main uh, main uh, like. Uh, main stack and it's having its small uh, small stack which it can grow and shrink according to its need. So, so that I am not wasting too much of my memory, it is having its own own stack and uh, own it is uh, so that own stack and it can grow and shrink according to my need. Next, scheduling. So uh, this example we saw, we have n number of waiters with m number of chefs the same thing is done by go as well so i can schedule it better i can i can control it okay it is giving me a good control on my uh, and it if i am scheduling it better so i will have a efficient context switching okay so i think you guys are aware that the, the context switching is the most uh, resource intensive for any uh, cpu right With Go routines, I have these channels. I have, uh, which is basically a power, very powerful tool to have that communication between your uh, uh, between your threads. So, along with these Go channels, wait groups, I can have a, I can I can design a good uh, concurrency model. And definitely, as my threads are now lightweight, I will have a good, I will have a very good performance improvement. <laughs> Now this, this would be OS thread, right? So let's summarize a bit like uh, what we covered so far. We covered go routines. Basically they are lightweight execution threads. Uh, we covered wet groups. They are basically, they are waiting for your uh, go routine to finish the processing. 
we have go max props which basically helps me to handle the perfect bit between concurrency and uh, parallelism and uh, we have this go channels which is basically my communication medium between uh, between my go routines any questions after this does a no well, section 2 we will understand how we can implement this concurrency that we uh, that we discussed so far so now my restaurant has scaled up a bit has scaled up a lot okay so i have started online delivery of orders as well so uh, as and when so i have i have deployed this uh, three delivery guys who are always ready on their scooter to deliver the order now as and when the my order is prepared in my restaurant any one of this delivery guy will pick this order and deliver it and again he will come back and wait for the next order same thing we will implement in go how can we do this we will have basically a channel and we will have process threads ready and listening to this channel whenever a message is coming to this channel any one of the process thread will pick up the message executed and again wait for its next message to come we we'll just implement a same kind of design uh, in go let's do a bit of coding now <clears throat> We'll take the same. Uh, uh, we'll take a bit of different example now. So what we are doing in this method? Let's understand this a bit. So uh, if you see, I have uh, this one is a max threads per channel. So I have specified this number. I will be deploying uh, five threads uh, per channel. Okay. And uh, this example we have created, we have we are we have created two channels. So two channels will have five respective threads listening to it. Next, this 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 whole loop, what it is doing it, it is uh, now we also know that if we don't deploy wait groups, my uh, main function will execute and uh, it will not wait for my subroutines to complete. So. What uh, in this case, what we will do is we are just adding the threads over here. We are just adding uh, adding the in uh, weight groups, and we are just spinning my uh, worker worker pools or the process threads. And let's go a bit up. Yeah. So this is my actual uh, method, which is just the simple task of it is. Consume the message from this channel. It will just use this arrow. Like this arrow is used when we are consuming the message from the channel, and it will just print it. A simple task. Okay. And uh, each time it is done, it will just uh, give a signal to the wait group that uh, this message is now consumed. Cool. And uh, apart from that, we have this uh, main function. Uh, this this doesn't do anything. It's basically it's an infinite for loop. Uh, here we are just creating the uh, worker uh, threads first and then uh, we are just pushing the messages one by one to the channel cool so we'll just execute this uh, execute this uh, snippet and see what what results we get the similar fashion we'll just uh, if you see that all my consumer threads are initiated and as and when the message is coming to my uh, channel one of the threads is uh, processing see if you see uh, hello in first channel message number 1 so it's basically consuming the messages my threads are started working and uh, it's consuming the message and printing it out <laughs>
Maybe we'll just see if we... So, so far, we have created our consumer pool. Now, the next things or the main uh, segment of this topic is, how can we design this producers and consumer? To understand this bit, uh, we need a bit of prerequisite of a message queue. So anyone, everyone is, anyone is like unaware of this message queue? Any, any, anyone? You can, you, can, you can tell me. Okay. So I will assume that everybody knows what message queue is. So uh, to take it as a brief, uh, it's, it's just a system where we have uh, multi, uh, producers producing to this queue and the consumer will consume from this queue. We have n number of producers and n number of consumers. They will basically produce and consume from your queue. So this acts as a medium. So we have different kinds of tools like available in the market, right? Someone uses, uh, we have RabbitMQ, SQS and Kafka and any other tools are there. Amazon, Kai, SQS, and they're, they're different, different n number of tools that, uh, that, that have this uh, technology. Uh, for our example, we will be uh, using Kafka because we need a setup to uh, demo stuff. So, uh, so to understand that bit, we need a we need understanding of a few of the uh, key terms of Kafka. So, uh, the first term is your uh, producer. Basically, they are your message producers. They have their task is to only to produce messages to my queue. Then we have something as consumers. Their task is to uh, just consume your messages from the queue. Then we have something called as broker. So brokers are basically nothing. It's uh, it's your uh, it's basically the nodes. Uh, if I am uh, if I am if I have deployed uh, three three servers, so one each of my server is a broker for my uh, for my Kafka cluster. Good. Next. Next, we have something called as topics. Topics are nothing. Uh, they are basically the queue. In Kafka world, we call it as a topic. But the uh, this topic in Kafka, they are partitioned. Like a single topic is partitioned into two. In this use case, the single topic, we have uh, the Kafka has created two partitions. Now the most, uh, or the one of the important uh, topic, or one of the important key points is consumer groups. So Kafka has this uh, basic, uh, you can say functionality where it groups the consumer. So suppose I have two consumers, C1 and C2, and they are grouped into a single consumer group. So what benefits this gives me? If a message is consumed by any one of the consumer, the other will not get the message. It's so simple. Like if two consumers in the same group, if one of the consumer is reading my message, the other consumer will not get that message. So it ensures that uh, I am consuming only, I am consuming the message only once. Uh, similarly, then, uh, I think SQS also have this kind, some kind of fashion or like RMQ also, we have some uh, a group, a consumer grouping. Cool. So for this use case, uh, the same topic, we have broken it down into four partitions. Now, uh, what is happening is, uh, now what, what it is doing is, if you see, Kafka has assigned one partition to each of the consumers and all these are lying in the same group. So in this use case, we have two consumer groups, consumer group one and consumer group two. Consumer group two has two consumer and Kaf uh, this Kafka, what it has done is, it will uh, assign two threads to each consumer. And on the other hand, this, this group is having uh, four consumer. So it will give one consumer, uh, one partition to each of the consumer. The basic funder remains the same. If any one of the uh, consumer, suppose from group, uh, group two, any one of the consumer has already consumed the message. So none other consumer needs to consume it. It will, the Kafka will not give the message to any one of the consumer. Simple. We'll do a bit of a setup. Uh, if anyone is uh, trying hands on with me, uh, just let me know so that I will wait. Yeah, you can uh, you can go to this link. Uh, if anyone is not able to access the link, you, uh, you can directly go to this. Yeah, you can directly go to this. Uh,
uh, you can go to this collaborated platform. I have uh, pasted the link. Uh, this you can just go to this uh, link and uh, get the link. From there, you can download the resources and uh, just a CD, Docker, and uh, our whole uh, setup is up and running. Cool. Yeah. So. Uh, so this is just a, a bit of an UI to give a, a visual feel like what is happening under the hood. Uh, so there we have uh, one, one topic. Yeah. So here we have uh, this, if you see this, uh, we have n number of topics and uh, this is one of my test topic. And uh, if we just quickly go So if you see that uh, there is no messages as of now, it is having a single partition. And this is, this is my consumer, uh, which having a group ID. And uh, as there is no messages till now, uh, the total, like some previous messages were there, which is already consumed. So the total size is now 1811 messages. Cool. We will just uh, write our consumer. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll write our producer first. To refer to this code snippet, uh, what we are doing is, uh, if anybody nexes the link, you will get that uh, full repo over there only, and you can just clone it and use it. What it is doing is, uh, but basically, basically creating the Kafka connection to the Kafka server first, and uh, it it will just uh, put hundred messages uh, one by one uh, using this write message command. Okay, just to note that uh, for this example to Demo we are using Kafka, but the but the same uh, architecture, the same thing you can that can be implemented in any other platform that you are familiar. Cool. So we'll just uh, run this code. So my program started running uh, and uh, we'll see the number of messages coming. We'll just quickly rephrase this UI. Yeah, if you see this, uh, this, this is the lag nine means uh, nine messages are already pushed in this queue and they are waiting to be consumed. Cool. So my producer is up and running. Any, any, any question you want to ask anywhere in doubts? Now we will start our uh, consumer. I will create a new terminal because the other one is producing already. So just quickly go and do a yeah. We'll just quickly look into uh, our consumer code now. So what it is doing? Uh, it is basically a simple, simple consumer, and uh, it the only uh, we are just consuming the messages. It's it's a it's a forever like uh, this one is a, a infinite loop which is just waiting. It is reading the messages and it will print the messages uh, one by one. So we'll just uh, run this code. So my consumer is up and running and it is consuming my messages. So in this example, it's just a simple, simple consumer. Now, next what we will do is we will implement our worker pool into this consumer. We'll quickly go to the slide. So the worker pool that we created, we will just use that worker pool to consume messages from this queue. The design remains the same. If we have seen the diagram also remains the same, just we are consuming messages from this queue. 
so let's go and understand what how how we can how we can achieve this just uh, explain a bit of the code do you remember this worker pool function that we created earlier the same function we are using we are basically now creating the worker pools the everything remains the same we are creating the worker pools and uh, they are waiting to consume the messages from my go channel okay and this 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 function what it does it it will uh, push the messages it will it will consume the messages from the uh, from your uh, kafka thread uh, from kafka from your uh, message queue and it will push the messages to your uh, go channel okay and the main function uh, it's basically initiating the consumer it's basically if you see if it's basically uh, creating the connection to the kafka and it will uh, like just create and it will just read the messages it will go to the reader read message function as well so the uh, purpose of this function is just to uh, read like the previous function that we used uh, to read the message we are using the same function the only difference that we are doing over here is this this method this part we are creating a worker pool so we'll just uh, quickly run this one and see how it is performing So we'll just do a CD. Let's we'll just go to the directory and uh, see like how it is working. Cool. Cool. So, first thing, we have initiated all the threads. All my threads are listening now. The consumer is up and running. So my consumer is ready. Now, what I need to do is I need to start my producer once again. Okay, to start the producer, we'll just quickly start uh, our producer to produce my messages and go to the consumer window. So see, as and when. my worker pools are already waiting as and when the producer is producing the messages i am just uh, the consumer is consuming it i go back to the slides any questions for the any questions uh, yeah kafka sounds similar to go channels so is it possible to use go channels for multi process communication yeah uh, we are using that only right if you if you see this this architecture right yeah so uh, in in real life applications uh, you cannot like if you are if you are having two systems right and you want to pass on the data right you cannot use go channels you have to have some message queue in place correct so what we are doing is this this is this is dash queue right and inside when you're writing the consumer you can use this go channel right and the go channel is basically communicating between your threads the the advantage i am having over is instead of a single single uh, main thread running i am i am deploying in number of i can deploy in number of process threads now that my processing is faster got it thank you anyone else now the challenge or uh, when writing production ready application is the, the challenge that comes is how to scale this up okay the scale up is a big challenge now so one uh, just uh, getting reference from this previous example 
one consumer i am having one consumer with this architecture so suppose i am i have deployed four process threads in one of my consumer now i want to scale up this system so what will i do is i will i can deploy n number of consumers so basically instead of if i am using a single thread i will be having only four process threads correct but if i am using this architecture if i am using this architecture at that point of time what will what what i am achieving is each of my consumer is having four threads so i am now having four into four that is 16 process threads with me so the level which i can i am i'm just i'm just using go concurrency and parallelism to achieve this feat this is how we can scale up. next so if uh, like some like if most of the most of the organization uh, or we use kubernetes we use this uh, that's a uh, term so it's that's an appendix uh, if we are using kubernetes uh, if uh, like one pod is one of your consumer and you can you can just scale up the pods like you can just use this to uh, to scale up your pods one by one and at the same time uh, we saw something as consumer lag right which, which which gives me the information that how much my consumer is lagging how like the messages are there waiting at the queue and how my consumer is maybe lagging is not able to uh, consume all the messages at the same time so we can just use that threshold to scale up my pods like maybe we can keep a threshold of maybe say per say 100 or 1000 messages if my uh, consumer lag is going beyond 1000 i will just scale up i will just spin up a new pod this was just a just a, a reference like if any of you guys are using uh, kubernetes in your uh, in your in your organization so this is this is what uh, we can achieve any questions or any use cases you want to discuss so one of the use case in book my show we are using this kind of a similar kind of architecture a similar kind of pattern is uh, for this one so uh, you might have you might be booking a ticket uh, on book my show for a very uh, heavy maybe a, maybe ipl or maybe some maybe some crazy event right where every user is really crazy to get his own own ticket right at that point of time uh, we have sub in this in this example suppose we have this only one seat left and one user has already entered our system and he has just blocked the seat now the next user who is coming either i have to show him that the seat is already blocked or uh, in the previous page i have to show that it's a sold out or it's a if it's like one or two seats I, i have to say that it's a filling fast for that kind of a system to be performant at that level we need to employ something that can scale up and scale down literally fast because like at high traffic we we just don't want uh, to give a user a, a very bad experience right so for this we have a kind of similar kind of a design we have simple simple kind of an architecture so what is happens is uh, when a user is coming and blocking that seat uh, we just drop a message to the queue and the consumer will take that message up and it will just uh, give the give this ui uh, like back end system a trigger that the seat is already sold out or the sessions are filling fast any final questions any uh, use cases that you guys have want to discuss we can discuss yeah uh, how go handles a uh, failures and cancellation of parallel tasks sorry there are two processes which are running in parallel and one uh, the parent thread is waiting for these two uh, to get complete mm. but what if one fails in between okay right yeah. so uh, got your question good question so i will just take a example of this code snippet so uh, if you remember uh, i just showed something called as a wg dot done right if you remember the statement right wg dot done okay so this uh, basically it signals the wait group that it has done its execution so at any point of time the the uh, the previous keyword that is deferred it makes sure that 
after the it, it is the last statement for the function to execute okay so if suppose uh, this method has failed for any chance like there is some error or something this method has failed at that point of time also this this statement will execute okay so my uh, previous with uh, previous uh, this it's waiting over here right and once uh, irrespective of whether it's an error or any scenario it will execute this done so uh, go uh, the wait group will wait till every if all the it's getting a signal that everything is done it will it will stop so uh, in in kotlin core routines what we do is we uh, handle this communication the whole whole communication via exceptions correct so if, if any of the child core routine fails it gets communicated to the parent that this is failed and what you want to do with this continuation means if you want to resume or restart or uh, complete parent cancellation so uh, these kinds of use cases uh, are there so but uh, in just in this example like just for example if you want to do an exception handling right you can uh, you can uh, like any other uh, error scenarios you can handle in this function right you can just give an error and uh, any kind of scenarios you can handle in this function but this last line will execute after the scope it is the last line of the function to execute now once this is done it is a signal to my wait group that i have done my the routine has finished its work so if it has any other routine waiting it will wait or it will it will also end i was just wondering like how go does it because cancellation is like very painful to handle in kotlin uh, so like it's i think it's pretty easier over here then kind of similar <laughs> Yeah, so you can do it in two ways, right? So once in the code, you can see defer, right? Defer wg dot done. So even if there's an error in that function, that that statement will always be called, right? So that wg done wg dot done will always be called. Uh, that's the first way you can. That's the first way it'll happen. Even if it's an error, uh, it will return an error. Or you can send it in the channel itself. So yeah. if you have a channel, in the channel you can have a struct which can have a value and an error. right so whenever you get an error that in that channel itself you can pass the error right so your uh, the go routine that is calling this will get that error as a value in that channel right so then you know that okay what error it is and then you can handle that error right that's a second way third way is you can pass a context so context was recently added so in so when you pass a context that and you can have timeout also associated in the context So if uh, suppose uh, there's no heartbeat in the go routine or whatever, right? That context can automatically be executed. Anyone else? Any other question? Cool, cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot.